Even my dogs are excited. <laughs> Shush. All right, am I on? I'm going to check right now. There you are. You're on. Okay, so I can start. Yep, you are on right now. Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Oz here from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship from my home. We had a few technical difficulties, as was expected. But we are on now, and we are going to get started this day, uh, the Lord's Day, our Resurrection Sunday service. Now, I'm going to go to Scripture, and I'm going to open Scripture. I am going to go to Psalm 103. Now, the reason for opening with Psalm 103 is since uh, since day 91 of the year, which was two Tuesdays ago, and I, I, I realized we were in uh, the calendar uh, day 91 of 2020, and I had been praying Psalm 91, I have been reading a psalm each morning and praying into it uh, from the calendar day of the year corresponding to the psalm. So we're going to start with Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Lord, we pray that you will heal our diseases and forgive our sins. Lord, you have linked these two things together, Lord God. Father, in the midst of this pandemic, forgive us our sins, heal our diseases. It is not that we are worthy. It is that you are worthy, O oh Lord. Worthy is the Lamb who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, uh, we need our youth renewed like the eagles, that we may fly and mount up on eagles' wings. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Lord, in this hour, we know the poor. We know the oppressed. We know those from whom justice have been taken are suffering, Lord, even more. Father, work your righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Lord, we want to see your ways and we want to see your mighty actions, your mighty deeds. Move mightily in our midst as you moved by raising Jesus from the dead by the glory of the Father. Raise us from the dead in this hour in our city, in our region, our state, our nation, worldwide, Lord. Move as your people on this day celebrate resurrection life. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Lord God, please do not repay us according to your righteous indignation concerning our iniquities. Let the, your anger pass, O oh God, and bring new life, Lord. Bring new life to the earth, to your people, Lord God. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, Lord. Give us the fear of the Lord and remove our transgressions. Remove this pandemic, remove this virus from us as far as the east is from the west. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. O oh God, you know our frame. You know our weakness. Strengthen us with your mighty power. 
From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. In this hour, Lord, may we pass our heritage, our inheritance, our mantle unto our children's children, even our children's children's children. Lord, and may that mantle be those who keep your covenant and remember to obey your precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord all his works everywhere in his dominion. Your kingdom rules, your kingdom reigns, O oh God. It's your dominion, let the entire creation praise you. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Grant this unto us today in Jesus' name. Now, just to give you a, a little bit uh, concerning the, the format today, the schedule, uh, you heard uh, uh, a word from my dog. Apparently that's for all the the dogs out there. But what we are going to do is next, Pastor Jan will be sharing a communion word. I'm going to give everybody a chance to go get communion. We want you to partake of communion with us, partaking of the Lord's Supper. We'll do this together. Uh, after that, I will share a, a message. I will close with prayer. We'll have some brief announcements, and then Pastor Jan will close uh, with prayer. So Jan, I'm going to invite you over here to the screen and she's going to bring the communion message. Well, good morning, Lord of the Harvest. Um, it's, it's very strange, isn't it, to be celebrating Easter like this, um, isolated in our homes, not gathering with families. But everything God does, he does with a purpose. He says he will bring good out of bad. He will bring joy out of heartache. Um, I believe that even though this has been a very difficult time, I believe God wants us to reach deep and down and um, find him in all of this. Find him for um, our souls, for our spirits, for our bodies. So today I, I, I do want to talk about the resurrection. I think it's it it kind of amazes me that um we have holidays in our america and christmas is probably the biggest and yes you know jesus was born and that was very very huge but but easter the resurrection was really a more powerful act uh, and yet it's, it's, in my mind, sort of minimized in our society. When I was a kid growing up, all stores were closed on Sunday, Easter Sunday. And on Good Friday, uh, as kids, we were expected to stay in our homes for three hours and basically do not a lot just to sit there and meditate. But you know how kids are. We meditated on when the three hours would be over. But I want us to think today about this word, essential, and hearing a lot every day, that word being said, essential, essential, essential. My one daughter told me that at some of the grocery stores now, they're roping off aisles for things that are non-essential. And I said to my husband, I said, that's, that's kind of funny. What, what would be non-essential? And I started thinking, well, if I was out of deodorant, that would be essential for me. Um, if I needed deodorant, uh, I mean, uh, laundry detergent, that would be essential. So it's interesting to me what the grocery store would, would count as non-essential. And I'm thinking probably the majority of it was non-food items. But we're hearing that all the time, essential, essential, essential. And it's and it's making me reevaluate my own life. What really is essential? 
what what can I live with and what can can't I live with? You know, um, in Russia, I just heard yesterday that um, people aren't even allowed to go out of their house without permission from the government. And of course, that has started a lot of um, uh, uh, suspicion of what the government's really trying to do over there. But the lockdown is important. Um, it's essential that we keep safe and we keep um, the virus from spreading. But when we look at that word essential, we need to think of what were the essential steps? What were the essential stages in Jesus's life? You know, he was born. Obviously, that was essential for us because if he wouldn't have been born, we would be in in uh, no better place than than we were before. So he came into the earth for a reason. And what else was essential about Jesus? Well, he went around healing and teaching, and he went around demonstrating the love of his Father. Um, he didn't he didn't um, hurt people. He tried to help people. He loved people instead of hating people. And even when people said things to his face or behind his back, um, bad things, he never retaliated. Jesus died a horrible, horrible death. I, I believe in that every sin, every sickness, every horrible illness, every demonic power was on him that that day on the cross for those three hours he was tortured beyond anything we could ever imagine and thinking about that if, if you want to read more closely of what he experienced read psalm 26 how not only did he feel all this this physical thing he he suffered mental mental anxiety mental pain from not, um, I'm sorry, it was Psalm 22, but from um, being separated from the Father. The Father could not look at him uh, being covered in sin like that. So he felt the separation from his love, from, from, from the very, very, very being he obeyed and, and was in constant contact with. This was unbearable. But he did it because it was essential. It was essential for him to die for us. What else was essential was that he rose from the dead. Because, you know, there were, my guess, and I don't, I can't say for sure, but I, I would guess that there were many uh, people then and many people even now that go around saying that they are God. But the proof that Jesus really was God was that he rose from the dead. And because of that resurrection, we are free. We are free from death's sting. What I think is so important, too, is that when we read in the gospel, uh, and I read all four gospels to see the story of the resurrection, um, and my favorite gospel has always been Matthew, or Luke, or John. The last one is Mark. But anyway, I want us to turn to Matthew 28, and we look at, We'll actually back up to 27, starting in verse 57. And it said, Now when evening had come, there, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him, and actually Nicodemus. And when Jesus had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewed out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Again, like Andrew had mentioned, this was in a garden. This was a brand new tomb. No other bodies were in there to be mistaken for Jesus. Um, and it was said, too, that Nicodemus brought um, like 75 pounds of oils to, um, to treat the body of Jesus. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. And those two women were just so heartbroken. Can you imagine 
you loved him from the from the minute you started following him his mother loved him from the day he was born and and he 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 was crucified he was murdered in front of your eyes and they and they they couldn't believe it and they were devastated and on the next day which followed the day of preparation the chief priests and the pharisees gathered together to pilate saying sir we remember while he was alive how that deceiver said notice they're still calling him names even though he's dead they still are fearful of his power and he said, after three days, I will rise. So I think they did believe. I think they really did know who he was. They just didn't want any part of him because he wasn't the king. He wasn't the Messiah they wanted. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way and make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, when I did a little research, I found out that the guards, and this is to me interesting, stood six feet apart. Isn't that interesting? Like in this hour, we are told to keep six feet from other individuals. And they were surrounding the tomb six feet apart. The other thing was that the seal on the, the, a big stone was rolled and it was on an incline so that when it was removed, it would be easier to remove. But it was sealed with a kind of a clay-like material and then it would have a seal marked on it, whether it was the Roman seal or maybe a Jewish seal, and a rope was attached to the seal. So when it was broken, when you pulled the rope and it was broken, you would see that it was broken. So these Pharisees were very much afraid that the real Jesus was going to escape or someone was going to steal his body, whatever. So they wanted to secure this tomb to make sure nothing happened. Now it says um, in chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Can you imagine you're walking up to the tomb and there's this great, it didn't say a little one, a great earthquake. Now, I've never experienced an earthquake, so I can only imagine what that felt like. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now, I wondered to myself, and I asked my husband, I said, was the earthquake because of the angel descending or because Jesus, there was like a nuclear explosion in the cave that represented or act was actually his resurrection power? We don't really know. And he said that it's never been thoroughly explained how that even happened. But we know God can do all things. And then it said, this is describing the angel, which I think really is amazing. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing is white as snow. Can you imagine? We minimize God so much. This is an angel, and he looks like lightning. What does that look like? And his clothing was white as snow. And he had to be strong, right? He had to be extremely strong to move the stone away. He had to probably be like the Hulk, dressed in white. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead man. What a statement that was. Here is Jesus, who supposedly is dead, and the guards who were supposedly alive were like dead men. God is amazing. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And he is not here, for he is risen. He is risen, as he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they went out quickly. Can you imagine? They're 
their heart that was so broken just a few days ago is alive again and they're excited and so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples the word and as they went to tell his disciples behold jesus met them saying rejoice and so they came and held him by his feet and worshiped him can you imagine today he rose from the dead do we grab him by his feet and worship him do we say thank you, dear God? Do we say thank you for this action, for this reaction, for this resurrection? Thank you, God, for, for delivering and setting us all free. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid and go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. You know, Jesus had the word essential in his mind when he did this. It was essential that he died. It was essential that he rose. He beat death. Death has no more sting, scripture says. And it was essential, if you look down to verse 16, and then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came and spoke to them, and here's what was essential. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So when you hear the word essential, from now until the slackdown is over, think of Jesus. Think of how he fulfilled his destiny in three and a half years. Well, actually, even before he began his ministry, he was obedient to his father, his mother, and, and, and learning a trade, a carpentry trade. So Jesus always knew what was essential. He was in tune with the Father, always, always listening, always obedient. So today, really contemplate on the things that Jesus did and the great commission he set forth that was essential. At this time, as we are all um, separated from those we love, um, having our family Easter dinners together, uh, let us pray that people will be touched by Jesus, that this day that there will be people realizing who he was and what he did for them. And so I hope right now you have your um, elements, you have your bread and whatever you have, crackers, bread, whatever. And... Um, you have your drink, whatever you choose. And we are going to now um, celebrate the Last Supper. Jesus said, whenever you partake of the bread, think of my body. Whenever you partake of the drink, think of my blood. Um, it doesn't matter what you have. We have tortilla chips <laughs> and um, juice, but whatever you do, it, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're gardening, you can offer it up to Jesus. Whatever we do, we should always be remembering who he was and what he did and how essential, how absolutely essential his life was to all of us on this earth. So Jesus Bless this, bless this meal, bless this, these crackers, these tortilla chips, this bread, whatever, Lord, we may be eating at this time. And bless the wine, bless the juice, bless the milk, bless the coffee, whatever we're drinking, Lord. That would, when, we, when we partake in this, Lord, that we are remembering you and we are saying, you are so essential to our lives. You are so essential to our very being. We thank you 
We thank you for believing that we were essential to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, turn the um, sermon over to my husband, Pastor Mike Osminski, and um, he never he never fails to deliver. So I I know not at all what he's going to share today. So I'm as excited as you are. Amen. Amen, Jan. Thank you so much. That was a powerful word. The question always is, what is a relevant message? What is the word of the Lord, particularly on this high holy day, this commemoration of the great work of God in Christ in raising Jesus from the dead? One of the things that um, we will remember uh, that I want to point out, and um, I just realized I for, I left my uh, phone on the uh, fireplace. <laughs> my wife will get that for me. When when we think of the resurrection narratives in Scripture, you realize not a single story actually describes the event itself, the moment itself what happened when Jesus actually was raised from the dead. But what each gospel stresses is that not how he was raised from the dead, but that he was raised from the dead. Luke sums it up well in Luke 24, 5 and 6. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. That's basically the the mantra of the resurrection. And the, the closest uh, phenomenon uh, describing the resurrection was what Jan already shared from Matthew 28, an earthquake. That's the closest thing we can, uh, we have to describe it. As far as Paul, Paul says in Romans 6 that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So the glory of the Father appeared to uh, set in a like event. That's probably just a human way of describing it. It was analogous to an earthquake. Uh, Jan also read in uh, from Matthew 28, the, the, the depiction of the angel, uh, you know, like lightning and, and, and glistening white. Now, that's a reference to uh, Matthew 17, the transfiguration. The transfiguration uh, where the disciples were on the mountain and they saw Jesus transformed is probably uh, the New Testament picture of what took place in the resurrection. This this. Uh, lightning, earthquake-like, glistening, uh, glorious white proceeding, emanating from, from the person of Jesus, even transforming uh, what his garments looked like. So what we want to focus on today is the fact that he is risen, because that's what the New Testament deals with. And the fact that he is risen has to do with the purpose of the resurrection. And as Jan mentioned, I, I, I have a, a kind of a bias toward the Gospel of Matthew as well. All the Gospels are incredible. I've taught all of them. Uh, they, 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 each one has a little bit of a different emphasis. Matthew's emphasis, though, dealing with the purpose of the resurrection, is this concept of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. All through Matthew's gospel, if, if we follow through Matthew's gospel, the references to the kingdom are very significant. Now, I'll, I'll refer to some. We'll look 
directly at some. I, I would like you to, to go to the Gospel of Matthew, open Matthew, and we're going to start with the very first reference to the term kingdom, which is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, and it's actually on the lips of John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is, in essence, a, a synopsis, a, a summary statement of what John the Baptist preached and taught, preparing the way for the Lord. His words were, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If we look at Jesus, when Jesus first goes out to begin his ministry, and that's in Matthew 4, 17, we know John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, the heavens open, the Spirit falls on the Son of God. Uh, God the Father declares, this is my beloved Son uh, in whom I'm well pleased. Um, you have a Trinitarian event, the baptism of Jesus. The Father speaks, the Spirit descends, and the Son receives that blessing from the Father and that anointing from the Holy Spirit. So Jesus begins his ministry after he's baptized he goes into the wilderness faces uh, the devil and then he comes out and 417 reads like this from that time jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand it's near he his message is in essence the same message that john the baptist has the, the summary statement of their message, their gospel, their, their ministerial focus is exactly the same. It's the kingdom. And, and, and of course, it's associated with this idea of repentance. Now, we've, we've heard many words. Uh, Steve Fado uh, from Master Builders prophesied uh, earlier in the year that this was going to be a year of repentance and revival. Uh, many people have um, uh, raised uh, the 1986 prophecy that David Wilkerson gave about the, the plague that was going to come to New York City, that was going to shake New York City. And because of this, there would be repentance. And, and, and Christians, uh, lukewarm Christians, would be in the word and praying fervently and devoted to Christ and discipleship. Many people are speaking at repentance now. Well, what is repentance actually? Repentance is reframing. It's reframing your understanding. It's reorienting the way you see things and view things. And of course, it's a, a major reorientation to the way God sees things. It's about embracing God's purposes. And we repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is God's reign. R-E-I-G-N. It's God's rule. It's the establishment of God's authority. And Jesus, as the Messiah, is the son of David. He's God's king to establish God's authority in the earth and establish God's kingdom. So John the Baptist begins with repent the kingdom. Jesus begins his ministry with repent the kingdom. And then if we look in, if, if we look also in uh, chapter 10 of Matthew, when Jesus first sends the disciples out, and 10 is, is, is Jesus sending out the 12, they're going out to minister, and Jesus tells them when they go out, in verse 7 of chapter 10, as you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the initial point I'm trying to make here and we'll we'll see it. I'll, I'll just do a, a quick go over of the Gospel of Matthew. You're going to see that the kingdom is is the real issue. The kingdom is the main point. In Matthew five verse three, Jesus's first instructional teaching, the first teaching discourse uh, that he brings in the Gospel of Matthew, he begins it with. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus talks about the Lord's prayer in chapter 6, he says, pray this way. Your 
kingdom come, your will be done. When uh, Jesus' uh, summary statement in chapter 9, verse 35, again, of, of Jesus' message is that he went forth preaching the gospel of, of the kingdom, healing people of diseases, breaking demon power. The kingdom is central, whether it's central for discipleship, it's central for prayer, it's central for ministry. When Jesus comes in Matthew 13 and he begins to teach parables, he says, I teach in parables to declare the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I'm, I'm going to reveal the, the, the fact that the kingdom has always been central to God's purposes, Old Testament, as well as now the gospel message and ministry of Jesus. You remember in the Old Testament, this idea of, of Israel coming out of the wilderness, coming out uh, into the wilderness, out of Egypt, coming to Mount Sinai, going to take the promised land. The Lord said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man is given a kingdom uh, from the Ancient of Days. Uh, and then he gives that kingdom to the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7 is such a pivotal, central passage in the Old Testament, and it's about the kingdom. Jesus' name, the Son of Man, the, the term that he used to describe himself comes from Daniel 7. He's the one who receives the kingdom. He gives it to whom? The saints of the Most High. We get this term calling believers saints. That comes from Daniel 7. It's about uh, our sainthood, saying that we are saints of the Most High God, is that we receive a kingdom. If you're, if you're, if you're getting the point here, if you're getting the point, kingdom was central to Jesus' ministry. This is why he was sent. When we talk about his being risen, his being alive, his dying and, and, and coming back from death, through death, raised by the glory of the Father, it has to do with the kingdom. Now, turn again, if you're in Matthew still, which you should be, Matthew 16. Matthew 16 is, is, is the midpoint of the gospel. It's the midpoint of Jesus's ministry as well. And in Matthew 16, we have this discussion. Jesus poses his disciples with a question, and he has this discussion with Peter. And Matthew 16, 13 looks like this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, the interesting thing is, remember, most of Jesus' ministry is, is, is within what we would call Israel proper. That would be Galilee, Samaria, Judea. When you get to Caesarea Philippi, it's, it's, it's considered part of, of, of Israel at that time, but it's, it's, it's a predominantly Gentile area. Jesus has been ministering within Israel declaring the, the, the reality of the kingdom, the centrality of the kingdom. Now he goes outside to a, to a heavily Gentile area. Keep that in mind because, as, as we'll see, the kingdom is not going to be simply the uh, possession of the Jews. It's going to go to all the nations of the earth. So when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? There's Son of Man from Daniel 7. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. His, his disciples are, 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 they got their, their ears to the ground and, and they're, they're letting um, Jesus know the popular speculation about who he is. Keep in mind that with the things of God, there's always going to be popular speculation. There's going to be popular speculation from believers and non-believers alike. And uh, we're, 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 we're not dealing with speculation. We're dealing with the Word of God. We're dealing with the purposes of God. We're dealing with the truth of Scripture. Even now, everybody and, and we're talking about many are coming as, as Christians with this prophetic word and that prophetic word. It's speculation. And we have to distinguish speculation in this hour in particular 
from the truth. We can go on the internet and you can get every prophecy that declares what's going on here right now is, is everything from a government conspiracy to the end of the world to, to uh, all kinds of, 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 of scenarios. But keep in mind, it is very, very important, very important for the church right now to hear the Lord. It's very important for us to hear his voice. It's very important for us to seek his face. And keep in mind, 2 Peter, we won't turn to it now, but Peter, uh, before he dies, he talks about uh, this experience that the disciples, he, uh, James and John, had on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he talks about they actually heard a voice from what he calls the excellent glory in Second Peter. The excellent glory was a was a, um, a a place in Judaism from where God the Father Yahweh spoke, and they said we we heard God speak. We heard God bear witness to Jesus. We heard this audible voice of God. He says, but you know the prophets. The prophets in the Old Testament prophesied of all these things. That's Old Testament scripture. The prophets prophesied of these things, and they were in agreement. They were in agreement with the audible voice of God. They were in agreement with Yahweh. They were in agreement with, with the, the one who is the, the Lord and master of Old Testament Israel. We, we are in absolute agreement. But he goes on and says, but we have a more sure word. And then he talks about the Bible, the written word, scripture. Scripture and what the Lord says always agree. It seems like we're in an hour now where people, all they got to do is attach, thus says the Lord, or the Lord showed me this, or the Lord showed me that, or I saw this, or I heard that. And they speak as if it's God's word. But remember, those who speak prophetically always agree with the written word of God. And if it departs in any way, shape, or form from the written word, we're not to listen to it. It's very important in this hour. Stay in the word and let the spirit speak to us in agreement with that word. A lot of speculation at that time, a lot of speculation now. But he turns and says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. Both terms, Messiah, son of God, it has to do with his kingship, his lordship, his authority. And we want the kingship, the lordship, and the authority of Jesus established in our lives in this hour in particular. And this is what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is all about. Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. See, see what, what Peter was confessing was in agreement with what the Father in heaven, what the Yakira said. That was the, the most excellent glory in, 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 in Aramaic, one, one of the terms that God the Father, that Yahweh was titled with. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, you are Peter. You're a, a, a little rock. And on this little rock, Peter, I will place that rock on a larger rock, and I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of death shall not prevail against it. Hades is Sheol. It's the place of the grave. It's, it's not necessarily the image for burning hellfire. Uh, that's Gehenna, uh, the lake of fire. Gehenna in scripture. Hades is death. Jesus is going to build a church on our confession of a revelation of who Jesus is, the king of the Lord, the master who is establishing the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. That's the foundation upon which Jesus is going to build his church. It's a revelation of who he is, and death will not prevail against it. Even in an hour where death 
seems to be all around us right now. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the revelation of Jesus Christ upon which he builds his church, builds us into a relationship with him and a relationship with each other. We need to stick together as well in this hour as the church. And then again, kingdom of heaven is in the background. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The keys to the kingdom come from bringing ourselves under the authority of the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. That's where our authority comes from. He has God's authority. He gives us that authority. Our authority proceeds out of our relationship with him. And then at the end of chapter 16, he says in verse 28, Assuredly, I say unto you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, of course, chapter 17 is the, is uh, we have basically the transfiguration. That is a picture of Christ. This There's going to be an immediate fulfillment and there's going to be a, a, a fulfillment in the near future of this. They're going to see the kingdom and the Son of Man coming in the full authority of that, like the transfiguration. They saw him there in the transfiguration, but what was the transfiguration? It was a foreshadowing of his resurrection. And it's interesting because um, Jesus, right after he told Peter and the disciples that they would have the keys to the kingdom. He predicted his death and resurrection. That's back in verses 21 through 23 of Matthew 16. And you know, Peter rejected that. And of course, the same Peter that Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, back in verse 17, that the Father revealed this to you, Jesus uh, rebukes Peter. In, in the in the 22nd and the 23rd verse, because after Jesus predicts his death, which is God's way of establishing his kingdom, of establishing his authority, death and resurrection is always God's way. Now, we need to understand this particularly in this hour. Throughout all scriptural history, through the gospel, through the New Testament, through church history, now, we always have to remember God dismantles and then God rebuilds. God tears down and then God reestablishes. God removes one way of doing things and replaces it with another. That's how his authority is established. That is how we learn who he is. That's how we walk with him. And we have to understand this. Is the Lord tearing something down right now in human history? I, I would say he most certainly is. Is he tearing things down in the church? I would say most certainly he is. We have to allow God to do his work. We're saying things like, boy, when we get on the other side of this, church will never be the same again. Well, that's normally God's purpose. He tears down that he might rebuild. And we have to understand this. We need to press in in this hour in faith, in trust, in obedience. We need to repent so that revival can come to revive means to reestablish a life it means to bring someone back from the dead you revive someone there they've stopped breathing and and you breathe on them and and they come back to life so that's what really revival is all about and we really need to stand firm in faith and trust with the lord right now and understand this is how he does things this is how he establishes his kingdom. This is how he, he replaces a, a, a failed system with a new, fresh, alive, better system. We are his people. He loves us. His hand is upon us. And we need to press through. We can't be like Peter. Jesus said in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. That was totally not the way the disciples believed God's kingdom was going to unfold. 
That was just totally not the way that they, that they were prepared to accept. What we're going through right now, I don't, I don't think it's, it was anybody's plan, anybody's hope, anybody's desire, anybody's prayer, but God does things. When he deconstructs, he deconstructs, he demolishes, but then he reconstructs and he builds something better from the ruins of the first. I, I, I've been in uh, Zechariah and Haggai recently and uh, in Zechariah 4, where it talks not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it talks about this mountain uh, in, the, in the way and in the path of, of uh, completing the new temple. The, the Jews had returned from Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed their temple uh, nearly a century uh, ago. And now they're called to, to rebuild this temple. Well, the mountain that was in the path was probably the debris of the old temple. The debris of the old temple was there. And, and the Lord said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, I'm gonna raise up uh, uh, Zerubbabel, the, the governor, the, my man, my apostolic figure, I'm gonna raise him up. Uh, he and Joshua are the two olive trees, my anointing's gonna be on them. They're gonna build this temple and they're going to, pour the anointing oil that I place on them into the, the lampstand to build up the people of God. And from a New Testament perspective, we could say to, to build the church with the anointing of the Spirit so that we might raise up a new temple from the ruins of the previous one. We may find after this pandemic that the Lord has ruined the the temple, uh, the temple that for all our lives we thought was so great and so awesome and so wonderful isn't a church and, and the anointing of the Lord and apostolic ministry and kingdom reality. Isn't it wonderful? And the Lord says, it's a, it's a pile right now of debris. And so the spirit will move that pile of debris. But was, what was interesting, when we understand how buildings that had been destroyed were rebuilt, they removed all the debris. They took one brick from the, from the previous edifice, in this case would be from the former temple, and they laid it as a foundation. They laid it in the foundation of the new building, and that's where Zechariah says, and you'll speak grace, grace unto it. And as I've pointed out other times, that's uh, the, the one place in, in the Old Testament where grace, grace, grace twice is spoken. So, brethren, we have to understand God may do things in a way that we could not have foreseen. I know a lot of people are lamenting that where were all the prophets? Why, why didn't they, they predict this? And there, 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 there were prophecies out there. We, we've mentioned Dave Wilkerson, among others. Uh, but the point is, is that, that how this is happening, even if somebody would have prophesied it, it's still it's so so over the top it's so outside the the lines to stop the whole world uh, jeff oaks from uh master builders uh prayed this at our our, our, our national uh, gathering of prayer we do this uh, once a week and he just said never in his lifetime and then he paused it maybe never in human history have all six continents been put to a stop by the lord so, brethren, may, may, may we see ourselves as truly as Esther. We have been raised up for such a time as this. But they, when the old men in Haggai saw that second temple, and it didn't look as big and as glorious as the first temple, the old, the old men who had been alive uh, in, in uh, Judea and, and, and had actually seen the former temple, they wept, but... Haggai says the glory of the latter house will exceed the glory of the former house. When God does something new, whatever it looks like, when the dust clears, it will be greater. So Peter took Jesus aside in verse 26, began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you, as many of us are saying in this hour. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, the same one as I mentioned beforehand. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this on you. 
Jesus now says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He goes from being, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, the one who's received the Father's revelation to Satan. He calls Peter Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. He's looking at Peter in the eye. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And in the future, I, I, I hope to talk about mountain moving faith. Uh, mountain moving faith. Ripping up the sycamore tree and casting it into the sea faith. Four times it's mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, twice in Matthew, uh, once in Mark, once in Luke. Perhaps even next week we'll share that. But what mountain moving faith is always preceded by is being mindful of the things of God, not being distracted by the things of man, but repenting and having a reorientation to see things God's way. All right, let's, let's uh, finish this up. Jesus talks later in Matthew, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And again, I, I know there's a lot of discussion. The eye of the needle was a place in the uh, the entrance into Jerusalem where a camel went. I, I that That's possibly true, but I prefer to see it exactly what it is. It's something really big, a camel, going through something really small the eye of the needle. Jesus is saying there are things within us that can hinder us from coming into the kingdom of God, but the Lord is there to bring us into the kingdom of God. And finally then, the last reference, the spe last specific reference to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew is Matthew 26 at the Lord's Supper. Jan just shared a phenomenal word. I, I, it's, it's really etched into my mind. What's essential? The body and blood of Jesus. That was, that was powerful. So Jesus' final reference to the kingdom, and again, I, I haven't covered all the references. I'm just giving you a kind of an overview of how from start to finish the kingdom is there. It's in the institution of the Lord's Supper. So Jesus says, Matthew 26, uh, verse 26. And I'm, re I'm reading from the New King James, which means I'm reading from uh, a different Greek text from uh, most of your Greek texts. If you have modern translations, that's okay. We'll, we'll do a teaching on textual criticism some other time. The Word of God is the Word of God. The idea that says, well, these different texts, you know, some leave all these important things out. Don't read those Bibles. Whatever text you're using in the New Testament. That's that that doesn't affect the old. The old is 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 a single text, the Hebrew Masoretic text. Whatever text you're reading, the gospel is declared very clearly. Whether it's the New King James or the NIV or the ESV, whichever translation you use. But I'm reading from New King James. 26, 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, the one thing I want to, I want to locate here as, as we close is we are actually right now in the very season, the very season that is the season represented in the Gospels. Passover was started uh, wet last this past Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. We're in Passover. Passover goes, and Passover goes then, and it leads into Pentecost. We know that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he was with his disciples 40 days and 40 nights, and I want to reference that because let's see what Jesus was doing in those 40 days uh, with the disciples, and then 10 more days and we have Pentecost. So the fact that, again, we're dealing with kingdom issues on Easter, we're dealing with the feast of the Passover in which the Jews are, are released from their bondage and slavery in Egypt. And then we know that 50 days after 
they departed from Egypt. They came to Mount Sinai. Pentecost, the 50 days of Pentecost after Jesus dies and is raised from the dead, corresponds with the children of Israel coming to Sinai, celebrating what the Jews call Sukkoth, which is the giving of the law. 50 days after the Passover, the law is given on Mount Sinai to Moses and to the people of God. And that's about covenant. That's cementing the covenant relationship with the people of God. And that covenant relationship was you will be a kingdom of priests. Now, our 50 days, our cementing the covenant is God writes his laws in our hearts and gives them into our minds when the spirit of God descends upon us at Pentecost. The spirit of God comes and anoints God's people now, people from all the nations of the earth, not just one nation, all the nations of the earth. He anoints them. He anoints them to be the kingdom of priests. So could, could, could we potentially say that God is reworking at this hour? He's giving us 40 days to press into the kingdom. He's giving us 50 days, and, and the Lord will pour out his spirit on the body of Christ, on the church, in a powerful corporate way that we might become the kingdom of a priest that he wanted us from the beginning. Maybe God's tearing down an, an old way of being church and going to build up a new way of being church. Seeing Jesus raised from the dead powerfully, hearing his voice, getting kingdom teaching to usher in a, a mighty outpouring of the Spirit 50 days hence. Well, whether it's literal 40, 50 days, or it's a re refers to a time period, if we're talking about repentance and revival in this hour for the church in the earth, a revival for, for, for the people of this earth, being made alive again from the dead, from, from this pandemic, from the, the grip of this curse and this darkness. Whatever it is, let's take this hour to press in. The next May the next 40 days for us be a pressing into the Lord as the body of Christ. So Jesus, Matthew 26, 26 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The new covenant is about partaking of the life of Christ. It's about the forgiveness of our sins. If, if you're out there and you're listening to this, you're, you're a believer and you're not right with the Lord, the covenant is about taking the life of Christ into your heart. It's about covenant renewal if you already know the Lord. It's about drinking his blood, having our sins forgiven. If you don't know Jesus, and we're going to be praying at the end of this message, if you do not know Jesus, if you're not right with Jesus, if you've been away from Jesus, it is time to press in to Jesus. It's time to get right with him. It's time to give yourself unto his lordship, his kingship, his authority. It's to have a revelation of who he is, that he's the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's the anointed one. He's the, the son of, of, a, of an Elohim who is alive. He's the, he's the, the son of God. He's the anointed one, the Mashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus says, and this is his final actual reference to the kingdom itself in Matthew. But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When will he drink it new with them in his Father's kingdom? After the resurrection. And after the ascension from heaven, he'll, he'll drink it anew with us every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. 
So the focus of the death and resurrection of Jesus is my Father's kingdom from start to finish in Matthew. I want to look at the last chapter of Matthew. Jan already referenced it in the communion message, Matthew 28. And then I'm going to finish up in Luke because Luke gives us Jesus after those 40 days, uh, after the 40 days he spent with his disciples after he was raised from the dead before he ascended to heaven, 10 days before the Holy Spirit would come upon them in Jerusalem. Jan started here as well, Matthew 28, 17. Actually, she started 28, 16, and we'll read it there. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I, I say that over and over because I'm I quote Matthew 28 a lot. I, the Great Commission, I believe, is a kingdom mandate that we've been given by the Lord. It is amazing to me that they're seeing the risen Jesus and some worship, some doubt. And I feel that that's a picture of. Of, of, of our struggle. That's a picture of our life. That's a picture of the process of discipleship. We alternate between worship and doubt. Again, we'll talk about doubt and we'll talk about faith uh, in, in, in upcoming messages in the future. But we have to recognize this is who we are. We need to resist doubt in this hour and we resist doubt not by walking in faith. We resist doubt by worshiping, and worship creates faith. Worship creates an ethos, a, an atmosphere, a zone, a realm of grace, and that realm of grace releases faith in us. So, so we need to fight those doubts. We need to fight those fears. We're going to have moments when we doubt. We're going to have moments when we fear. I mean, part of this pandemic, at least for America, it's welcome to the way the rest of the world lives. Welcome to the way the rest of the world exists. We, we received a, a text message from a, um, a brother in, in Africa, another part of the world. And he said, we, we basically what, what the message that came across me is saying, we, we face Boko Haram. That's a, that's a Muslim terrorist group in Africa that, that murders Christians, enslaves Christians, traffics Christians, rapes Christians, forces Christians into uh, uh, departing from Christianity and, and becoming Muslims. And he named three other groups. Uh, obviously, probably radical groups. I don't even know who they were. He mentioned we face these groups every day. He said, we face cancer like the rest of the world. We face Ebola. We face AIDS. We face gross poverty. We face famine. And now we have to face the coronavirus as well. But the point was, they're looking over their shoulders. Our brothers and sisters in many nations of the earth are looking over their shoulders constantly, wondering what's going to quote unquote get them next. That their enemies are great, their enemies surround them, but they press through, they persevere. See, we're not used to that in America. Listen, America, we have American privilege, and my own personal perspective is. Whatever privilege we have, it's by the grace of God. It's not because we earned it, because we're better than everybody, because we're smarter than everybody, because we're more righteous than everybody. But right now, we're getting a taste of how the rest of the world lives. And all that is, is brethren, is repent and believe the gospel. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means to reorient your thinking. We need to understand this. And this lesson will be powerful. This lesson is necessary for us to walk where God would have us to walk. So we're going to struggle, but we answer doubt with worship. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority. See, the word kingdom isn't there, but the word authority means the king and his kingdom have been established by the, his death and his resurrection by the king of heaven, his father, Yahweh. 
all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And here's the real message of the kingdom. It, 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 it follows here. This is, this is a, 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 a significant conclusion. It's a, it's a summary conclusion that ties together the message of the gospel of Matthew. What do we do with the authority? We go and make disciples from all the nations. It's not just Jews are the chosen people. It's not just America's the chosen people. It's just not white people are the chosen people. It's just not black people are the chosen people. That is a denial of the gospel. Who's the chosen people? The whole world, all the nations of the earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Kingdom mandate number one. Kingdom mandate number number two, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus' baptism was a, an encounter with the triune God, when disciples are baptized, they have an encounter with the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And third aspect of the kingdom mandate, teach them to observe, to obey everything I've commanded you. Fourth, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Fifth was, if, if we really, uh, the three mandates are, are make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey, but they're, they're, they're encased in a first and a fifth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and the earth. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. His authority is that he is with us. That's how he communicates his authority unto us. Do you know Jesus? today. Is Jesus with you? If, if you know Jesus, if he's with you, he will communicate his authority. Now for the church, the body of Christ, I want to close with Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 says, We'll start with the first verse. The former account I made, that's the Gospel of Luke. Luke and Acts are part one and part two of the same book. The former account I made, O Theophilus, that's the person that Luke addressed uh, the Gospel and Acts to. The former account, Gospel of Luke, O Theophilus, which I made concerning all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The gospel is the story of Jesus doing and teaching. Acts of the Apostles will be part two. Jesus will be doing and teaching, but now through the church. Until the day in which he was taken up, that's the ascension, took place 40 days after the resurrection, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he spent the 40 days giving them the commandments that he would tell them in Matthew 28 to teach his disciples. To whom he also presented himself alive. He is risen. He is alive. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and watch. Well, Jesus, well, we know what, what Matthew would say. Probably you did those 40 days. What will Luke say you did during those 40 days? Speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom. The purpose of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, teaching ministry. Ascension, pouring out of the Spirit on the church, it's about the kingdom. And brethren, let's take the next 40 and 50 days, however long it takes to press through this pandemic, let's press into the kingdom. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now remember that first a uh, part of the encasement of the, the three requirements, kingdom requirements in Matthew is all authority in heaven and earth has been given me. And the fifth is I'm with you always. Well, this is, this is how Luke declares it. The promise of the Father is coming. The promise of the Father is the conferring of my 
authority to you. The promise of the Father is my showing that I'm with you always. It's imparting myself so that you can know that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and the keys of the kingdom will be yours, and I will build my church on this, and the gates of death will not prevail against it. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And this is inserted to show you that even disciples who've seen Jesus so clearly, he's been with them, showing them infallible proofs for 40 days and 40 nights, can still have their theology off. This is, an, this is something that their theology is off. They still have in their mind how God is going to do this. And how God is going to do this is God's going to privilege a certain people. We're the Jews. We've been privileged. You know, and, 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 and many people through history claim to be now the modern day Jews or the real Jews, but that's to miss the point. There is no privileged people with God. His kingdom is for everyone. When, when, when we talk about American privilege, there is no American privilege. When we talk about white privilege or black privilege or whatever privilege, there is no privilege when it comes to the kingdom. They make a, an incorrect statement here, an incorrect theological statement. They asked Jesus the question. When they'd come together, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, the Lord is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. He's going to restore the kingdom to all the nations of the earth. So rather than going into a theological treatise on, you know, preterism or futurism or, or amillennialism or dispensationalism, Jesus just says, listen, guys, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And that's, that's, that's always what's important. We need to figure it out, and we need to figure out what God's doing in this hour and how he's going to do it. But, but here's the most important thing. This is what we focus on. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put under his own authority. There's that thing, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The authority is the authority of the kingdom. But then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses or witnesses unto me, as the New King James says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We need to bear witness to Jesus. That's the important thing right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to close with a, a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from the ESV. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. As we're pressing through, let's remember, he's risen, he's alive. Now, if the Messiah is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. Our Handling this pandemic is in vain. Our pressing through into the kingdom is in vain. Because he lives, he said, we shall live also. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ, not even Christ has been raised. He repeats himself. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who've died in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But then he counters that. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So we close with that. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And because he lives, we shall live also. I'm going to pray this prayer. And 
for those of you who are listening, if you're not right with the Lord, follow this prayer, pray this prayer, pray your own prayer, but reach out to the Lord. Become part of this harvest, this end time harvest. Well, it is the end times because uh, it's uh, the way we've done things up to this point, it's over. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the end times of the way the church has done business. What that means for the second coming of Christ, well, we, we, we trust in the Lord. We hope in his coming. But you pray this prayer. Those of you who don't know Jesus, call upon him now. Submit to his kingdom. Submit to his kingship and his lordship. Father, I come before your throne in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I know you, Lord. I've, I've, I've given my heart to you in the past, Lord. I've, I've walked with you, or, or perhaps I haven't walked with you, but Lord, I'm not right. And Lord, we understand if this pandemic does not put the fear of the Lord in our hearts, I do not know what would. Father, I, in the fear of the Lord, I repent. I change my way of thinking. I change the way of thinking where Christ is not at the center of my life. Christ is not the center of existence. I've made myself the center of existence. I want to change that. I want to repent. Your kingdom is near. It means it's at arm's length. I can reach out and grasp it and touch it. Lord, would you reach out and grasp and touch? Reach out and grasp and touch us that we might reach out and grasp and touch you, Lord. Father, I pray for those who have been lukewarm. Pray for those who've been backslidden in heart. Pray for those who have embraced their self-life and embraced sin, Father, but yet who call themselves by your name, Lord, that today they become on-fire Christians as you take the fire, the heavenly fire from your altar, and you touch their hearts and you set them ablaze, Father, as they return to you, as they repent, as they bring themselves under your lordship forever, Lord, and Lord, they they once again embrace, re-embrace their baptismal vow that they would follow you all the days of their life. And we pray that for those who aren't right with God in the name of Jesus. Lord, for those who don't know you, but desperately need to know you and are being stirred by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invoke you right now. People who are listening, not only, Lord God, to, to my message, to Jan's message, Lord, but are, are listening to the gospel being preached anywhere and everywhere that it's being preached today on Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we invoke the Holy Spirit to come and enlighten them, Lord, of their need for a Savior of their need for a Lord, of their need for a new group of friends, <laughs> of their need for, for a new master to direct their lives, Father. For those who respond to that, we pray, Father God, we come before your throne. We ask you, Lord. We ask you, Lord. We ask you, Lord. Send your Son the spirit of your son into our hearts. We embrace his life, his death, his resurrection. We embrace the incarnation that God became man in Christ. We embrace him as Lord God, and we say, send the spirit of life. Breathe on us, Lord. Lord, in an hour where we need to breathe, where we're struggling to breathe, Lord, Breathe on us and say, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive new life. Receive regeneration, quickening power. Lord, we ask this in the name above all names. And, 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 and we know, Lord, there, 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 there could be people all over the earth hearing this right now. So we pray it in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Yeshua. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Isa. We pray, Lord Jesus, whenever we call your name, you respond to it, whatever 
language we say your name, Lord. You know who you are, Lord. You respond to the cries of your people, Lord God. Grant this unto us, Lord. May there be a harvest of souls, an end time harvest, Lord. And Lord, for your church, may we press through in these next 40, 50 days, Lord, into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before Jan uh, closes us in a, a final prayer, I'm going to make some announcements. These are Lord of the Harvest announcements. Uh, you can go on our website and see all of this. Um, we have a food pantry at Lord of the Harvest. It's considered an essential service. It's a dangerous service. Please pray for our, our workers. Um, but it is a, it's a stay in your car, drive through. And we keep changing the days. Uh, we're down to two days. So we are now going to be open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And the pantry, as we said, is now being operated as a drive through only. Please stay in your car. But pray for our, our, our pantry workers. Lord, we, we put a blessing over all of our pantry workers, Father. We put the blessing of Psalm 91 over them, that no plague will come near them. No plague will come near their dwelling. No plague will come near their family. That you'd watch over them and protect them because they, they're, they're living the gospel. They're keeping people alive. And, and we pray for our neighborhood and, and the people that come to us, Lord. We ask that you would protect them from the coronavirus. You would break the power of COVID-19 in them in the name of Jesus. Also, we have, um, we've got a Bible study right now that we've started uh, online. We will continue to meet on uh, Facebook Live here, live streaming. Uh, until the Lord shows us and does otherwise uh, in our, our, our city and our state and our nation and our world. So we will always, we'll be having every Sunday, we'll have a Bible study at 10 a.m. And we'll have a, um, a live service uh, here the, the, with the sermon and the message at 11. Uh, the Kingdom Education is a Bible study. And it's, it's every other Wednesday from 6.15 till 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's the next class will be Wednesday, April 22nd. The first class was uh, April 8th. This past Wednesday, the first class coincided with Passover. Um, and the next one will be Wednesday, April 22nd. If you're interested in getting involved in that Kingdom Education Bible study, Pastor Adrian Bird from Lord of the Harvest is teaching it. You have to... Uh, it's a Zoom meeting format, so you have to be invited by, uh, you get an email link. So if you want to be part of that Bible study online every other Wednesday from 6.15 to 7.30, please send us an email at the, the church email, which is LHCF. L is Lord, H is Harvest. C as Christian, F as Fellowship, the number one, LHCF1 at Comcast.net. Uh, you need to sign up for that class. We also have a Thursday night, a Thursday night uh, online prayer meeting. We, we pray from about eight, 7 to 8.30, and it's just it's open for, for everyone to pray. Uh, we have some leaders, uh, Scott Gross, Gene, Scott Grosjean is 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 leading that. I call him Gross Gene. It's Grosjean is the the right pronunciation. Sorry, Scott. Uh, let's see if I'm getting corrected online. Um, but Scott leads that, and we start off with some leaders praying, and then we open it up to prayer. It's again every Thursday night, seven till eight or eight thirty, just depending on how many people want to keep praying. We we usually go from seven to eight, but last week uh, everybody wanted to pray till till eight thirty. Uh, two weeks ago, I should say, we uh, were involved with the Sacred Assembly this past Thursday. But that's also a Zoom format. So if you want to be involved in it, send an email to lhcf1 at comcast.net. You have to get invited and we'll get you there. Um, we know that most everything's on hold right now. May 7th was supposed to be the National Day of Prayer. We're going to see what God does and what kind of format we can figure out for that. Uh, the May 8th was supposed to be our Greater Detroit Partnership. That's a network of churches 
urban and suburban churches that partner about 30 churches. We've been doing this for 13 years and, and we work together on, on releasing the gospel in our city. That was supposed to be on May 8th. That joint worship service right now is going to be rescheduled. We, we will deal with the joint worship service uh, as uh, we, we see what unfolds uh, in our, our nation. Uh, finally, uh, if you want, we are accepting tithes and offerings at Lord of the Harvest. We need finances to keep our food pantry open. We need finances to help our people uh, who are part of Lord of the Harvest. Uh, we have set up an online PayPal account for those who don't attend church but would still like to send their tithe to donate. You go to LHCF Warren slash backslash support. You click on the donate button and follow the directions. Uh, members of Lord of the Harvest, you can continue to mail your checks in. Uh, make sure to mail your checks to the post office box. That's Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 26505, Fraser, Michigan, 48026. Again, post office box 26505 Fraser, Michigan, 48026. And you can either go through PayPal or go through um, the mail. With that, we're going to wish you blessed Easter. Hang in there, saints. Persevere. The word of the Lord is going to continue to go forth from Lord of the Harvest every week. Every Sunday, every other Wednesday, Thursday nights we'll be praying and we, we may start some other Bible studies up. We'll just we're just being led by the Lord in this hour right now. Uh, Pastor Jan, if you could close us out. Well, first of all, I want to thank Rob and Andrea for helping Pastor um, get this set up because we are not computer technical geniuses to say the least and so we appreciate their help um secondly i i do want to say that um we know so many people that are struggling with the um virus right now and you probably do too um one particular church in queens pastor wilson Carmeras and his family um we really want to hold them up in prayer because if you live in New York, um, you know that it's not an easy place to be right now. Um, we have the privilege of having backyards and, and, and most of the people in the cities live in apartments. They don't have that. And so a lot of people, uh, Pastor Wilson thinks that most people have contracted the virus in one way or another. So keep them up in prayer. I also want to keep up in prayer all the health care workers and the grocery workers, all the people that are um, supplying us with our essentials to keep them safe. And in particular, uh, people in our own church like Joyce Underwood and uh, Rose Grossjean and um, I know Philip and Janine's daughter, Hannah, and my daughter, Elizabeth, who has contracted COVID-19. We want to really hold her up. And she's in quarantine now and seems to be on the mend, but we want to make sure that God really touches her and delivers her from this um, virus. I, I just want to commend my husband for an incredible word. And I want to finish with Psalm 126. Um, I'm going to begin. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. And I just want to say, you know, we're all captive by something. Um, some people are, are captives of alcohol or drugs or, or gluttonous or maybe material things or whatever you can fill in the blank but when he brought us back when he delivered us from that we were like those who dream and then our mouth was filled with laughter you know when we look back and think about when we first 
encountered Jesus, we were so happy. And some of that has left us. And our tongue was singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually, continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves, the harvest, with him. Lord, it has been very clear to us today that your desire was for the Great Commission, that everything you did was for the whole earth, not just for a selected group. Lord, we pray today, Lord, that you touch every human being on this planet, Lord, and that you touch their hearts. And if they're away from you, Lord, if they deny you, I can't even imagine people that say there is no God. But Lord, if, Lord, there are people, and we know there are people like that, Lord, you would just touch them, Lord, and open their eyes that they would see how foolish they've been. Dear God, dear God move upon this world, Lord, and deliver the captives, Lord, set them free so that they can dream and laugh. And Lord, that, that they would realize, Lord, that what they did was so off and so wrong, Lord, that it would bring them to their knees, Lord, and they would weep for your greatness, Lord, for your forgiveness, Lord, for your dying and your resurrection, Lord. We thank you for this day, and I pray every day would be a resurrection day for us, Lord, that we would remember your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jan. Powerful. Before we sign off, I just want to leave you all with an exhortation that's also a blessing. Uh, this morning on our national uh, prayer conference call. We do it every Sunday morning. We had uh, the, the pleasure to uh, have Steve Fado, uh, just the, the prophet of God. Um, uh, I guess if you don't know who Steve Fado is, you, you, you haven't lived. Uh, that's what Bobby Walker used to say. But um, uh, Steve led us in prayer, and, and he closed with this image, and I'd like to close with this image because it, it ties the present situation in with um, Jesus' resurrection. Powerful. Steve said that after Jesus had died, and before he had been raised from the dead, they were hiding in fear in their houses. And Jesus came to them and appeared to them in their midst. So, Lord, I pray a blessing on all those listening, Lord, all those who are part of Lord of the Harvest, Lord, all those who are, are, are just particularly in our city, our state, our region. I pray a blessing. I declare, may the risen and ascended Lord come and appear to us in his apostolic glory as we stay in our houses hidden away for fear. Do it, Lord. Do it powerfully. May the church begin to report appearances of Jesus as you reveal yourself to us, Lord, and you encourage us and you encourage our families. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Well, we're going to be signing off. Thank you uh, so much uh, for tuning in with us, brethren. God bless you. May the peace of the resurrected Lord be with you mightily. Amen.